Right. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A moment of your time, please. Thank you so much, sir. Professor Sutherland. Stop to watch you. Thank you. Uh, right, now we're here for the main part of the game tonight. Um, we're very privileged to have our special new friends who are residents of this fantastic establishment. Yeah, yeah, I hope yeah, you yeah. enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. We enjoy your being here. Thank you so much. So this is a world, a world first for the Western Society, something from Japan. Um, we know the connection with, with Georgia and with Professor, uh, Professor Margaret Donald who is probably the most highly acknowledged um, Whistler scholar ever. Although, I think Professor Sutherland's catching up pretty quick. No, 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 he says. We might know differently. Anyway, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good evening. It is a great honour to have the opportunity to give a talk at the Whistler Society. Um, I'd like to thank my long-time dear friend Georgia and um, Professor Daniel Sutherland for introducing me to the Whistler Society. Um, the title of my paper is Whistler and Nihonga, Globalization of Modern Painting. <laughs> and most of us have a nationality, but does a work of art have a nationality? Where does the feeling of being British, American, Greek, or Japanese come from? Now I would like to show you two paintings. The one uh, on the left is by Murakami Takashi one of Japan's leading contemporary painters. The painting on the right is by Yamamoto Hiroyuki. He is among the major painters of Nihon Bijutsuin, the Japan Art Institute, which was established by Okakura Kakuzo in 1898. Murakami and Yamamoto studied the Japanese style painting Nihonga at the Tokyo University of Arts. Do you notice a sense of Japanese in these paintings? Murakami referred to the super flat as a characteristic of traditional Japanese pictorial expression. The idea of his flower motif is based on a traditional Japanese subject, kachō fugetsu, flowers, birds, winds, and the moon. Yamamoto used iwaenobu, or mineral pigments, and mikawa, or glue made from animal bones and skin. Currently, Nihonga is defined by works created with iwaenobu, and Mikawa. Yamamoto's delicate moisture expression of soft color is characteristic of Nihonga. For several years, the Japanese have been asking themselves, what is Nihonga? Japan had remained isolated for the rest of the world for more than 250 years and concerned about the characteristics of its own traditional culture. There is little need of comparison with other cultures because Japan had developed its culture within the East Asian region. Moreover, we were a closed society. However, once the country opened itself up, Western culture which was radically different from that of Asia, was introduced in Japan. The West became the object of comparison, leading the Japanese to seek the characteristics of Japanese culture in a Western-centered world. Today, I would like to discuss the encounter between the West and the East in the age of globalization at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. 
The painting on your left is Harmony in Blue and Silver, mm. Torobill, painted by James McLean Whistler in 1865. On your right is Sunrise on the Sea, painted by Nihonga painter Shida Shunso in 1906. Whistler's work predates that of Shunso's by approximately 40 years. However, similarities exist in the use of delicate thin paint and horizontal brush strokes. Does this indicate that Shunso was aware of Whistler's work? The slide presents a brief overview of the world of art in Japan during the Meiji era. The word bijutsu, fine art, was coined as a translation of the German word Kunstgewerbe. I hope my pronunciation is okay. That's great, dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, to reflect the category of exhibits at the Vienna World Fair in 1873, in which Japan participated for the first time as a unified nation. <laughs> Beginning with the world's first international exposition in London in 1851, expositions were successively held in major cities in Europe and the United States. Because the Meiji government was aiming for the encouragement of industry, exhibiting at these world expositions was a good opportunity to encourage an increase in export. The Meiji government selling the culture as a commodity strategy was the popularity of a strategy and the popularity of things from Japan can be can, said, can be said to be synergistic. Major officials encourage the production of artworks and artifacts with a Western focus to acquire recognition in the West. The basic terminologies for the finer arts, such as kaiga, painting, and chokoku, sculptor, emerged in the mid-1880s. Because of Japan's participation in the World's Fair and the categorization of exhibits at the National Exhibition for the promotion of domestic industry, Nihonga emerged as a conceptual term to refer to the paintings of the traditional schools of painting in contrast to yoga. The paintings established by the ingestion of the Western style during the Meiji era. In 1878, Kuki Ryuichi and others who were concerned about the rapid westernization of Japan formed the Ryuichikai, Dragon Pound Society, which was renamed Nihon Bijutsu Kyokai, Japan Art Association, in 1887. Later, Nihonga was divided into the old and new schools. The old school attempted to inherit the traditional forms of painting from the pre meiji era. Meanwhile, the new school sought to reform the conventional forms of painting by actively adopting Western style expressions and creating a new Japanese style painting. This school founded Kangakai, the Painting Appreciation Society, in 1884, which was the result of an internal conflict within the Ryuchikai. Ernest Francisco Fenosa, a government-funded foreign employee who was a central figure of Ryuchikai, began working with Kano Hogai, to create a new style of Japanese painting that blended Japanese tradition and Western style expressions. This caused discord in the Ryuchikai. Amid the nationalism and emerged as a reaction to the rapid Westernization of Japan after the opening of the country. 
the new school was especially promoted by Fenonosa and Ogakura Kakuzo as part of their educational policies to create a new style of Nihongura. <coughs> At the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, Yokoyama Taikan, Shida Shunso, Shinomura Kanzan, and Saigo Kogetsu established a more modern and unified style of Japanese painting. They were students of Okakura who founded Nihon Bijutsuin, the Japan Art Institute, for the development of Japanese art in the new era, and we were active members of this institute. <coughs> Can you see? No, 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 no. Just fine. Modern Nihonga played a role in creating a new artistic expression during the great wave of Europeanization policies that promoted industrialization under the slogan of civilization and enlightenment. Third, the creation of a modern Nihonga emerged in the context of westernization of Japan, where Kusura was inspired by Japanese art to establish his most original paintings, Nocturne. I would now like to discuss the similarities between Whistler's work and modern Nihonga. When Whistler went to Paris in 1855, he became fascinated with Kurube and was influenced by the realism present in the art world. At the same time, he became interested in Japanese art. While in Paris, he remained in contact with Japonizon, such as Felix Blackmore. The figure in the foreground of a harmony in blue and silver, Toru, is Kurube. The painting was established, exhibited at the Copley Society in Boston in 1898 under the title of Kurube on the Beach. In the late 1860s, in an attempt to develop his style, Whistler attempted to combine the arts of the East and the West by adopting various styles and techniques. In a letter dated 30th of September, 1868, to his friend Fantanatu, he wrote, quote, the colors should be, so to speak, embroidered on it. In other words, the same color reappearing continually here and there, like the same thread in an embroidery, and so on with the, uh, with the others, more or less according to the importance. The whole, forming in this way, the harmonious pattern, look how the Japanese understand this, they never search for contrast, but on the contrary, for repetition, end quote. In this letter, he refers to the importance of color as a component of painting. In the 1870s, he began painting atmospheric tonal paintings of nocturnal scenes with gradations of color. Harmony in blue and silver, Torvo, was painted with a fluid, smooth arrangement of colors in thin pigment, eschewing the perspective tradition of Western painting. It shows the process of Whistler's encounter, acceptance, and application of Japanese art and how he searched for his expression based on his understanding of color in Japanese art. <laughs> Shunso entered the Tokyo School of Fine Arts in 1890, where he learned Japanese traditional branch strokes under Hashimoto Gakko's supervision. The representation of lines was important in traditional <laughs> Japanese painting. However, Shunso began to adopt the Western expression and worked on a new 
painting style with lines seeking a new expression. According to Taiken's recollections, Okakura suggested that there might be a method to represent air and rays of light. Shusu, with Taiken and others, experimented with an expression without brush strokes and introduced Western painting techniques in Japanese painting. The suggestive expression, which has something in common with whistlers, can also be observed in some paintings by Taikan and Shunso during their stay in Europe and the United States between 1904 and 1905 and immediately after their return to Japan. They worked on the technique of painting with mainly mute lines and colors to create a new expression in Japanese painting called Morotai. When Taikan and Shunso exhibited their works in London, resemblances between Morotai and Whistler's Japanese works had already been indicated. This will be discussed later in this presentation. Taikan and Shunso arrived mm -hmm. in New York on 2nd of March 1904 and for approximately a month toured exhibitions and expositions. As their funds were running low, they decided to organize exhibitions to sell their work. These were held at the Century Association, New York, Oliver House, Cambridge, a National Arts Club, New York, Fisher Gallery, Washington, D.C., Greaves Gallery, London, and Echo de Bozal in Paris. To review their exhibitions, newspapers referred to Okakura's article in the exhibition catalog. The Vigitin or New Old School of Japanese Art. The Boston Evening Transcript, for example, quoted Okakura, quote, art must be national and Japanese painting should not be separated from tradition. At the same time, however, individuality is the essence of vitality and our aim is to be true ourselves. End quote. Such artistic representation as an expression of an individual's inner word is an essential element for art in the modern era of Western Europe. With this trend in, with this trend in Western art in mind, Okakura may have been keenly aware of the role of Japanese painting in an increasingly globalized world. On 13th of July, 1905, the Daily Mail published a review of exhibition, Whistler of the East, Modern Japanese Art at the Great Greaves Gallery. The article reported the activity of the Nihon Bijutsin and described it as equivalent to the Pre-Raphaelite movement in Britain, owing to its intellectual return to the perspectives and techniques of past masters like Ohata Kobe. The Manchester Guardian wrote, quote, one comes on these pale and determinate pictures of misty landscape with a curious shock. It is all so plaintive in sentiment, so self-consciously poetic, and a little anemic. One sec second sensation is how much better Whistler did these things. <laughs> <laughs> the East End, with its two pale sharp hosts, there is an elegant decorative pattern and nice color, but on the whole, these works do not touch one keenly from any side of one's sensibility. End quote. <laughs> However, Frank Ritter, a critic for Sunday Times, wrote, quote, 
the fact that these landscapes by Mrs. Yokoyama and Shida remind one more of the work of Whistler than any other painter. Oriental or Occidental is a proof not only how wonderfully our own great master observed the distinctive features of great Japanese art. <clears throat> a passion for richness and delicate color and a perfect sense of balance in design. But how modern in feeling is the work of these Japanese painting? End quote. Furthermore, Luther prays praises their ornate and delicately colored landscapes, writing, quote, our interest in them can, sorry, our interest in them can but be enhanced when, he learn, when we learn that their creators among the leaders of the little army that is even now fighting against the powerful and officially protected forces which already have well nigh brought about a complete decadence of Japanese art, end quote. He evaluated the efforts of Shunso and Taiken as avant-garde in the old-fashioned Japanese art world. Did Taiken and Shunso see Whistler's painting? They possibly saw harmony in blue and silver toro, a nocturne blue and silver battersea reach in the collection of Isabel Stewart Gardner because Okakura remained in close contact with her. Additionally, Taikun and Shinso may have seen Whistler's works at retrospective exhibition held in Boston London and Paris in 1904 and 1905. Based on Taikan's recollections, we may infer that they visited the exhibition in Paris, which opened on 1st of May 1905. The catalogue of the Paris retrospective indicates that 184 works were on display, including oils and watercolors pastels and prints. The exhibition showcased the evolution of Whistler's career, including his early masterpieces and exotic Japanese influence works, such as Nocturne, Blue and Gold, Southampton Water, and Nocturne, Blue and Silver, Crimo Night. To paint the Nocturne, Whistler prepared his paints in advance on a palette and coated this material source, which is so thin it run off of the canvas. Instead of standing the canvas on an easel, he sometimes painted on the floor as if he were painting a Japanese painting using pigments as thin as water-based paint. According to Taiken, to paint moral type, one must first wet the paper or silk with water and thereafter apply the paint and dab with a dry brush. Japanese painting mainly involved brush and ink line drawing on paper or silk, sometimes with the addition of color, but leaving the white ground untouched. However, in Moro Tai, which was created using a new approach to spatial expression. Brush strokes were eliminated. Colors were blurred using a dry brush. And gradations were added to the ground to express air and light. In other words, the artist did not leave any white space as in traditional painting, but painted light colors to vaguely express space. As discussed, certain resemblances exist between Shunso and Taiken's Moro Tai paintings and Whistler's tonal paintings. However, this does not imply that Moro Tai or starting point of their experimental attempts were directly influenced by Whistler. 
As already indicated, Taikan and Shusso's expression of Morotai is evident in their works created before visiting Europe and the United States, such as Silence and Landscape of the Four Seasons, produced in 1896. Notably, at the starting point of Morotai, the picture plane is set back to express the depth like a Western painting. In contrast, the Morotai paintings produced during their stay in Europe and the United States evidenced an awareness of the flatness of the painting. Therefore, Shunso and Taika must have gained greater awareness of Japanese traditions during their stay in Europe and the United States. The similarities between Whistler's tonal paintings and Taikan and Shunso's Morote appear to derive from an explanation of the pictorial space. However, there exist hints of an interesting power, which is in an essential part of painting. After returning to Japan in 1905, Taikan and Shunso jointly presented a paper entitled On Painting. In this paper, they expressed their strong interest in color and wrote, quote, We are now in the spirit of making further progress in the study of color. The line is almost literally in, nat literally in nature, because lines explain describe and appeal to understanding. But on the other hand, color is a stimulus, a shortcut that appeals exclusively to the sentences. In fact, unlike literature, music, sculpture and architecture, the essence of painting resides exclusively in these tones." <coughs> End quote. Taikan and Shunso argued that the line is descriptive, like writing. In February 1885, 20 years before Taikan and Shunso, sorry, 20 years before Taikan and Shunso published on painting, Whistler gave a lecture at the Prince's Hall in London entitled The Ten O'Clock Lecture in which he rejected descriptive painting and advocated the autonomy of painting. Taikan and Shunso described linear depiction for realism as explanatory, whereas Whistler rejected the narrative and explanatory element of Victorian painting, such as anecdotes and lessons. These three artists shared perspective of painting not being concerned with telling a story, but with evoking the senses. Thus, artists in the East and the West sought a new form, of, a new form of expression. Globalization in the second half of the 19th century led to a rapid diffusion of visual information. However, research into new forms for artistic, artistic expression cannot be based on the simple argument of if an artist has seen another artist's work. The similarity of the expression between Morotai and tonal painting seems to suggest complex, complex intercultural interactions in our increasingly globalized society. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, was there much going the other way? Yes. So both ways. Yeah. Because it's 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 extraordinary. Any any questions from the floor? Yeah. Um, I was saying for a, a wonderful talk. I think it was a great, um, fascinating insight into the Japanese response, if you like, to the aesthetic movement. We always think of Whistler as a component uh, of the aesthetic movement. And that involved not merely um, kind of 
appreciation or if you like Oriental Japanese senses of color and of balance, but also a huge love of Oriental artifacts, pots, rugs, fabrics, silks, all of those things. I mean, do you think there's any sort of, I mean, you, obviously Japan was very much influenced by the aesthetic movement in the sense, but was there a same appetite for European artifacts, furniture, pots, all that sort of thing, apart from you know, flat art, so to speak? Yeah. Does that make sense? Two ways for Well, I mean, the, the, the Japanese interest, you talked about the new school, which yes. you suggest, I think, was influenced by the European approach to yes. yes. pictures. Um, but the European interest was also in all sorts of other things, not just art, but things like pots and porcelain, yes. rugs and fabrics, and so yes. on, I mean, which they themselves had colossal forms like garden, you know, preserves and fabric and human dresses, models, and these silks and so on to make them more atmospheric. But what sort of an equivalent response to that do you think in Japan in terms of interest in European um, artifacts? Yes, yes. And we, you, you are talking about uh, Meiji export wares. Uh, we must know that what kind of Japanese object Hosla was looking at because we Japanese responded to European taste, not only paintings but porcelains or yeah, like uh, kimono or textiles and many Japanese. So we tried to um, to meet demand of European taste. Yeah. Did they cater to that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Although we thought that it's not a good idea in the end. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that happened about 1878 Paris Exposition. Yeah. Hmm. We made a big success in 1894 Vienna International Exposition. So we thought it's a good idea to produce something which meets to European uh, demand. But in the end, European people thought it's boring. <laughs> That's not what you wanted. Mm. You wanted something old. Yes. Yeah. We're very influenced by Whistler. And there was a very strong pictorialist uh, um, movement in, in, in Japan. So do you think the paintings were taking ideas via the photographs as hmm. well as directly from each other? Yeah, possibly, yeah. They may have seen some reproductions. Yeah, in yeah. The studio magazine. Yeah, 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 yeah. We had a studio and we imported in this period. So they may have seen Whistler's work in art journals, but it's black and white yeah. image. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking of photography, 1840s, and Daguerre and Galatai, mm. and uh, William Henry Fox Talbot. Mm. I watched the film for two years. Mm. Uh, if you, we were together then. Mm. Uh, and I think of Japan, so we've got Britain, we've got Daguerre in France, 1840s, photography is what, Kalatai. When does that arrive to Japan? And in when does... The, the very end of Edo period, that 1850s to 60s. Ueno Hikoma was the first photographer. Okay. Yeah. And do we know the whereabouts? Were they like Japanese with European... Um, do, do you know? I mean, I mean, how that worked out. I mean, we don't need to. Uh, we imported from. Uh, I think it came from the states. It went to the, sta the, the, the you know the photography. The technique of photography came from I think the states. Yeah, we got it. But there are several ways of getting those <coughs> techniques. So, 
because I might be just like a completely totally different chapter of Whistler and Japan and photography, mm. and, you know, and the connection of and the interconnections is like it's, it's a fascinating project. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk it later. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Any further questions? <laughs> Sorry. Can you speak up just Can a little bit? Up, did they ever actually meet in person? Did they meet in person? Who? <laughs> the people in these days, photographs? That's probably impossible. No. They saw one another in photographs and admired one another's artwork. Mm -hmm. and did they correspond or meet? I mean, Daniel one another's artwork. No. Whistler met um, Kaneko Kentaro, who was a friend of Okakura Kakuzo mm -hmm. at Athenian Club. His, his mm -hmm. friend, and he's also, uh, Fenno also was very close to Kaneko Kentaro, who met Whistler in London. Uh, yeah. And also uh, Shugyo Hiromichi, who helped the collection of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Ukiyo collection, uh, Shugyo Hiromichi, who helped uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, he met Whistler. Mm. So there are wheels within wheels. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. 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 Interesting. <clears throat> so I know two Japanese people who met Whistler. Yeah. Yeah. Any further? Well, oh, sorry. Yes, yes. A, a quick question. There was a mention of the yellow room uh, with a lovely yeah. sofa. Yeah. Where, where was that? Yes. Is that a Stuart Gardener's? Uh, yes. yes. Thank you. Definitely <laughs> recommend it. These paintings were, I think, displayed on that. Yes, they yeah, are on yeah, the wall they there. Yes. 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 Uh, sorry, question, question for me. Um, from your presentation, which was very, very interesting, and thank you very much, it appears what you're saying is that Taikan and Shunso were very, interest, very influenced by Whistler. Whistler himself must have been very influenced by uh, what I understand is the, the the arrival in Paris of Japanese art. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that the Japanese art, particularly the silk uh, depictions, were less concerned about perspective and, and therefore more two-dimensional and, and less concerned about definition, which from my understanding, uh, influenced quite a number of artists in Paris and, and possibly Whistler to be less, to present paintings in a less photographic, defined way and more environmental and more uh, a feeling of the place that you're in, mm -hmm. which I gather the, was, a, was a, an influence on a lot of artists on, on, on how Japanese, the older the, uh, Hokusai and, and those that just represented images. In, in, a, in an entirely different way to the conventional schooling of, of British artists. Mm. What would be your thoughts on that? And, and how would you think Whistler himself was influenced in that way by the introduction of Japanese art uh, to, uh, to Paris? Why, why Paris? I mean... Well, because Whistler himself is in Paris. Yes. Plus, uh, my understanding is that Paris was one of the first uh, yes, yes, he, he first encountered Japanese, Japanese art in, in, in uh, Paris, yes. yes. But it's always um, difficult to talk about Japanese prints and paintings. People think that Hokusai and Hiroshige are typical of uh, Japanese expressions, but actually not. Paintings and prints are totally different. and. Like Hokusai, he was influenced by Western art. So for you, it looks maybe flat, but for us, he was influenced, by, totally influenced mm. by European art. So I'm not sure how, how to explain. It sounds like it was a two-way street. Yes, yes. yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. And understanding of Japanese for European people 
and understanding of Japanese for us are slightly different. But maybe you are looking at Japanese paintings in Whistler's way because you share. Yeah. 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 Unlike mine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm. Very interesting. I wonder if my answer is okay. Mm -hmm. I wonder if my answer is okay. Yes, is okay? yes, yes. It's a big question. Yeah. Very big mm. question. And, but I think there's. Obviously, you've opened up a Pandora's box, right? Um, Anything further? Yes. Uh, well, it gives me an enormous pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hands to life. Right, right.